Today I'm going to discuss about basic science and how basic science can lead to innovation. And innovation is among one of the outcome of basic science. There are many others. I will need more than 18 minutes to tell all of them to you. So in 1995, I went to Sherbrooke University to do my degree in chemistry. In Sherbrooke, I have met many of my friends of today. I have met the person who became my wife, who is truly supportive, because being a scientist means working a lot and having crazy schedule. So you need someone supporting behind. So when I went to Sherbrooke, initially, it was purely for economical reason why I want to have a degree in chemistry. With the chemistry degree, I knew that I will have a job afterwards. I will, have to be, I will be able to cover my living expenses and have a good life. That's why I went to Sherbrooke. <laughs> That's it. But when I went to Sherbrooke, I have met my first mentor. My first mentor is the person on my right, André Bandrock. André Bandrock was my professor of quantum chemistry, statistical mechanics, and spectroscopy during my chemistry degree. And with him, I have learned two things. Being passionate and working hard. But I want to thank André for something else. I want to thank him because he's the guy that has introduced myself to a scientific community animated by a dream that I'm going to tell you today. And with him, since I have met a new scientific community, I have met my second mentor, Paul Corkum, who is on my left. So Paul was my co-advisor during my PhD degree at the National Research Council Canada, such a great institution, the institution of Gerhard Erzberg, Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 1973. When I went working with Paul, I have learned one more thing. So, of course, Paul is passionate, working hard. But with Paul, I've learned to become a scientist. Choose your problems carefully and work hard on it and never give up. Because science is mostly failure. We hear about failure today. We fail all the time when we do science. But the joy of success deserves to work hard. So what's the dream? The dream of this scientific community. If we go on the street in Montreal, of course, there's not that much people dreaming about this. <laughs> I can tell you that there are three persons in this room from my group that also dream about this. <laughs> we want to image chemical reaction with high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. What we want to make is a molecular movie of chemical reaction. We want to see, like the people dancing, we want to see the atoms and the electrons dancing. <laughs> and basically, here in this reaction, the proton is dancing, he's jumping on the other side of the molecule. Let's go back. So you have acetylene, you have a hydrogen atom, a carbon atom, another carbon, and another hydrogen. When this molecule absorbs light, this molecule starts dancing. And then the hydrogen flies to the other side of the molecule. Such a beautiful chemical reaction. <laughs> no, but it's true, it's a beautiful chemical reaction. We have hydrogen atoms in our body. We are full of water. If you remember your science education, in water, there's two hydrogen and one oxygen. Hydrogen is dancing everywhere. What are the spatial scales? So when you want to make a movie, there are two important things. You need spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So let's first discuss the spatial scales. So if you look at the height of the Everest mountain, thanks to Wikipedia, the height of the Everest mountain is almost 10 kilometers. A human. We measure the height of a human in meter. I'm about 1.8 meter. If you look at the bacteria, something that is really small, but that we are all aware of, they are full of bacteria in hospitals, for example. <laughs> the bacteria is about a micron in size. A micron is a meter divided by one million. You can see bacteria with a light microscope, with regular light, with a microscope, you can see the bacteria. Well, the atoms, the problem is the atom is much smaller. 
is 10,000 smaller than the bacteria. And in fact, if you look at the ratio, the ratio of a bacteria to the Everest mountain is the same as an atom to the human height. So you cannot watch atom with a regular light microscope. You need a more fancy microscope. You need a microscope where the regular light is X-rays instead. X-rays were discovered by Röntgen at the end of the 19th century. For me, this man is one of the most important men in the history. With this man, we had got X-rays that are now used in hospitals and when you go to the dentist to take images of people. You can see he took an image of the end of his wife. You can see the big ring. You can recognize from 100 years ago, you can see the bone structure. Imagine at the, big, at the end of the 19th century, such a discovery that now still impact our society. But of course, physicists, we are like kids in a way. When we discover something new, it becomes like a toy. So people had a new toy, x-rays. So we played with it. And so in the around 1910, people observed x-ray diffractions from crystals for Nobel Prize to brag in 1915. But then people were able to make crystals of proteins like DNA. And then using x-ray diffraction, Watson and Crick were able to, to, to take a picture of DNA to retrieve the structure of this molecule that we all, all have in ourselves, this molecule that defines life science. But here, so far, I'm telling you about taking pictures, not yet a movie. Here's an example of a movie, Scientific American, 1878. The big question in the 19th century, one of the big questions was, when a horse is running, whether the four legs leave the ground. We all agree in this room that we have enough spatial resolution with our eyes to see an horse. And an horse is pretty big, we see it clearly. But when the horse is running, none of us can tell whether the four legs are leaving the ground. So there's a clever man called Murbridge. What he did, he has installed a series of cameras next to the racetrack where the horse is running. And then he had put a delay between taking the pictures, and then through a series of pictures, he was able to confirm that the four legs leave the ground. You can see here. So it's not with our eyes that we've been able to confirm whether the four legs are leaving the ground. It's through making a movie with a series of cameras. So what's the time resolution that you need for atoms and molecules to see those electron dancing? So here is the most simple atom you can find, the hydrogen atom. Basically, at the center of the atom, you have a proton. The proton, you can see it as the sun. And then the electron is like the hurt, and this electron rotates around the proton. So what is the time scale for this rotation? Well, if you look at the atomic circumference, so the length of this racetrack, it's a, such a very small number. I will not tell you this number. You can see a lot of zero after the dot. It's really small. But when you look at the speed of the electron, well, it's nearly eight millions of kilometers per hour. This is really fast. In fact, if you compare the speed of the electron to the speed of light, the electron is the loser. But if you compare the speed of the electron to a sports car, guess who is the, the loser? So now, if you take this length, and you divide it by the speed of the electron, you figure out that it takes 152 attoseconds to go around the hydrogen atom. What is an attosecond? Well, let's start first with the age of the universe. <laughs> we heard this morning about the universe, and I agree with those two young men. The universe is such a su something so fantastic. There's a lot of scientists working on this. I'm interested by the smaller time scale, okay? So the age of the universe is that much zero. So this is thanks again to Wikipedia. So there's, well, you can count there's 17 zero. So this is huge. The attosecond is here. There's almost the same number of zero, but after the dot. In fact, if you look at this, there's about the same number of attoseconds within a second than the number of seconds within the age of the universe. 
So human, we have no conscience of the age of the universe as we have no conscience of the electron time scale. Now let's talk with something that we, are, we all know about, the minute time scale. I mean, humans live on the minute time scale. When you give an appointment to someone and you say, okay, can we meet at five? If the person arrives at five, five and three seconds, you don't care. If the person arrives at 5.01, you don't care. At 5.30, then you care. So we live on the minute time scale. Even though we live on the minute time scale, their organization, like the F1, they have invested a lot of money to have the millisecond resolution. So to distinguish the winner from the loser at the next F1 in Montreal, we need millisecond resolution. And now, when you will go to the next F1 Grand Prix, do you think you can make a movie with this shitty camera that I hold in my hand? <laughs> no way. This doesn't have enough temporal resolution. It has enough spatial resolution. If I take the picture of the car when it's not moving, this has enough spatial resolution but it doesn't have temporal resolution. So for the electron, I simply need a camera, a better camera, that emits very short light pulses, very short flashes of light. We need attosecond pulses. How we make attosecond pulses? Well, we make attosecond pulses with kind of a complicated laser. So here is a simple laser. And here is the complicated laser that we have at the Advanced Laser Light Source. It fits within 25 meters square. With this laser, we can generate very short light flashes. And with those very short pulses, we try to make attosecond pulses, attosecond flashes, to watch the electron dancing around the atom. So the laser, this kind of laser, was discovered in 1960 by Mayman. Since 1960, we have worked a lot on the laser to improve the duration of those flashes. So we went from millions of attosecond to in 2001 to the attosecond regime. Here there are a few data points. I have to say and I have to acknowledge there's been a lot of people working on this. A lot of students spending their night in the lab working hard, working passionate. In 2001, we made the breakthrough. Finally, we got to arrow second flashes. And what we want to do at INRS, so now we are at 67 arrow second. Well, another group, not my group. We can make 67 arrow second. We want to reach 20 arrow second. So with the current laser technology, we cannot make 20 arrow second. We need to build a new laser to enable those very short light pulses. Here's this laser. I will not go into the detail. Well, you can basically see the figure of our recent publication that has been accepted. Scientists, the reason why we work, we love publication. I can tell this is the thing that I've learned with working with André. I'm fully addicted to publications. But when we have seen this device, we thought, well, there are applications beyond attosecond for this device. So that's why we have this PCT. This is basically a patent pending. So INRS has protect the intellectual property. And now I will show you there's even a, re a guy working in my group who has started a company, FuCycle, to commercialize this new laser. So this is myself in 2002 when I have joined the NRC, the National Research Council Canada. When I went to NRC, my, I was animated by doing basic science. That was the reason why I was ready, and you can ask my wife during the break, I will spend two days without sleeping working in the lab. Basic science was my passion, my motivation to go to work. And today, Thanks to my research team, because science is not something that you do alone. You need people working with you. Thanks to this research team, I still have the same motivation when I go to work every day. Basic science. But among the possible outcome of basic science, there's innovation. So within this group, the group, 
There's Bruno Schmidt here. He has started the company to commercialize this technology. I have to say, currently, government tries to force us to work more and more on innovation. I can tell you if they force me to work only in, on innovation, I will change my job. My motivation is still basic science. Basic science is the best way to extract from scientists their creativity and their imagination. Of course, I'm not saying that we should give funding to all the people doing basic science. The best way to extract the best from scientists is to make them compete, and then you judge them on scientific merit. But you don't force them to work on innovation. Innovation is something that comes from creativity and imagination. Thank you for your attention.